Welcome to Biology 2402 Lecture Series, Chapter 24, The Digestive System. In this chapter, we're going to see that there are several main functions for the digestive system. Again, we are going to see the circulatory system and the lymphatic system playing a role along with the digestive system. We're also going to notice that the digestive system, in terms of its functions, are two main things. One is the digestion and the other is the absorption. So digestion and absorption. We're going to start with this first slide. This slide tells you that we're doing two basic things here. Acquires nutrients from the environment, that's what we do, and we use that to form anabolism and that's how we take our raw materials bring them together, assemble them together to make whatever we need to make. Likewise, we're using the energy as catabolism to break things down. So we have two functions involved here, anabolism, catabolism. Next slide. Now, of course, this slide here tells us that in order for us to do this catabolic action, we'll need oxygen. Now, of course, oxygen along with this second box right here, carbohydrates. Now looking at this slide, you should immediately notice something from general biology as well as 2401. And that is, if I take carbohydrates along with oxygen, I form my aerobic respiration. C6H12O6, which is my carbohydrate, plus oxygen making CO2 plus H2O and energy. So we're going to get our energy from either the carbohydrate form, or the fats, or the proteins. Next slide. Now on this slide, we have to keep in mind that we really have the digestive tract to be sort of inside our body, but at the same time it's sort of outside our body. Now this tube that they call here the digestive tract, it goes from the oral cavity all the way to the other end. To the anus. Now, these terms that you see below, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, they're all part of this long digestive tract, this long tube. And again, in essence, as long as you're in the tube, you're really not in the body according to the biological definition. So, when you're in the digestive tract, you're not really in the body until you're really absorbed. So that's the catch, and that's why they make that subtle distinction. Most people don't, but technically there is a distinction where this digestive tract is sort of outside the body. Next slide. Now this picture right here can be found on page 864. So page 864. Now one of the things that you have to understand about this chapter 24 digestive system is what you're going to need to do is for each one of these things that you see on the slide we're looking at, the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, each one of them will have two main contributions. It will have a mechanical contribution and a, me and a chemical contribution, so mechanical chemical contribution when it comes down to the digestive part. So when we have a digestion, we have a chemical digestion and a mechanical digestion. And that's what each one of these categories, one way or the other, will contribute. So as you create your notes for this chapter, it is important to understand that each one of them contributes a chemical aspect and a mechanical aspect. Next slide. Again, this is now the organs that aid this digestive process. You have the salivary gland, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. In each one of these cases, you see words like secretion. And that is why I said a moment ago that each one of these things plays a mechanical role as well as a chemical role in the form of a secretion. So it's a good idea to have an outline where each one of these organs has a chemical or mechanical aspect, especially this previous slide that I mentioned. 
So make sure you have a mechanical and a chemical, and that's the best way to outline this chapter. Okay. Now, these are the six official functions of the digestive system. The first thing we always do is we put food in our mouth. So the act of putting food in the mouth is your ingestion. Then, as I said, we have a mechanical and a chemical. Now, the author of this particular book has broken down mechanical process digestion separately, but most authors will have digestion itself broken down into mechanical and chemical. Then we have secretion, again, part of the chemical. And then we have absorption. Now, to me, the two main ones are digestion in the, in the form of chemical and mechanical, and the other is absorption because that's what we do. Now, remember, absorption slash reabsorption is basically the same thing in the sense that we're returning it back to the blood. And whatever does not end up in blood and stays in the gut, eventually it is excreted. Now, there's also other forms of excretion in the sense of we're having ions, chemicals going from the lumen or the lining of the intestinal tract into the gut. So we do use our gut not only to make food go through and not only to absorb stuff, but we're also using it to excrete stuff by way of waste. So we are actually throwing things into the gut as well as absorbing things. Next slide. This is why we have them broken down for you. So we have our ingestion, mechanical, digestion. And notice the author is actually considering digestion here as chemical. But remember, there's a, a mechanical digestion along with a chemical digestion. Next slide, secretion. And we're going to see that we are always dumping things into that lumen area of the intestine. What purpose? To help digest our food. The next slide talks about absorption. And again, as I said, absorption is primarily to get it into the blood. We have excretion. And part of excretion are these two terms down here, defecation and feces. Make sure you're able to define these two terms. We'll see them again. Next slide. Here we have the lining of the digestive tract. Now this slide is a very good summary slide to keep in mind. Why do we have this lining? Well, one, bacteria. Okay. We're adjusting the bacteria. So bacteria either ingested with the food or reside in the digestive tract. And the bacteria in the digestive tract can be good and bad. Depends on what kind of bacteria you have in there. Why do I have lining? Well, you should know by now from Biology 2401, the lining of the digestive tract plays a role because it's epithelial. It'll play a role in mechanical and digestive. So there's a digestive and a mechanical aspect to the lining. Next slide. Here we have our lining with serous membrane. Again, what do you see here? We see visceral peritoneum, and of course, we have the parietal peritoneum. Make sure you know these two. So these two are very important. So visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum. You should know that the peritoneums secrete what? Especially this one. They secrete serous fluid. And from Biology 2401, you learn that serous fluid serves to lubricate the organs in the organ lining area. Next slide. Here's that fluid and the purpose of. So peritoneal fluid produced by the serous membrane. This is the same serous fluid that I spoke of. So same serous fluid. If you have abdominal surgery, that's, that fluid is leaking out. It's going to have some friction, some pain for a while when you move around. And then eventually it will build up and the pain will go away. So it allows for sliding without friction or irritation. And if you did not have it, every breath you take, every movement you make 
it's going to hurt. The bottom turn right here, that's worthwhile knowing because there are conditions where this happens and that's not good. You get a big fat belly as a result of this. Next slide. Okay, mesenteries, these are the linings in the very small blood vessels that supply the abdominal region and the intestine tract. This is just a general slide to keep in mind. This slide, again, notice passage of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. So passage of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics in the digestive. Okay. This slide's worthy, worthy of knowing. Next slide. This one, don't care too much about. This picture, don't care. This slide, I do care. This one's important. So the lesser omentum and this falciform ligament. You're going to see it on the liver. Again, where does this come into play? On lab exam day or lab day. Make sure you actually look at the models. So when you're looking at the torso and on lab day, make sure you look for these things. So lesser omentum and the falciform ligament. Next slide. This one is important, the greater omentum. It is a fatty apron covering the abdominal region. It acts as a shock absorber, cushions that abdominal region. Next slide. Now this is a slide definitely worth knowing. Why do I have the greater omentum? I gave you this one a moment ago. Pads and protects the surface of the, of the abdomen, conforms to shapes surrounding the organs, provides insulation, storage of lipid reserves. That's your fatty apron. Okay. So this slide is definitely worth keeping in mind. Next slide. I really don't care too much about that. Next slide. Don't care too much about that. Now, this slide, I do. So this slide is important. Again, we see the mesentery here, the lining. So this is what, this mesentery sheet contains the blood vessels, the nerves, and the ligaments. That is important. So blood vessels, nerves, and ligaments through there. Okay, so this picture is definitely worth keeping in mind and knowing. Next slide. This slide is important. Now again, as you can see, that we have compartmentalization. That compartmentalization is part of your peritoneal cavity. So this is important to keep in mind. You'll see this as a torso model in the other room. Okay. Mesentery. Okay. This one you saw. This was an actual picture even in 2401. So you can see the different chamberizations. Here's an outer chamber, labeled for you as parietal because it's the side view. Had it been the front right here, that would be a visceral. And had it been the very back portion, that would have been the retro peritoneal. But you don't have that view here. Next slide. Okay, now, on this slide, you see the different layers of the digestive tract. Now, this slide is important in terms of name alone. However, each one of these is shown and labeled as a picture form. So that's the one we're going to go to next. So these four layers are important. And here's the picture version of that. So four layers, very important. Now, of course, you know that the mucosa layer is really referring to what? as you can see from the picture. It is part of the epithelial layer. Now this view is nice. This view shows it to you again. And notice I said a moment ago, mucosa. Mucosa has in this case the mucosal epithelium. The other thing to keep in mind is this term that we saw before. In the past, when we use the term lamina propria, 
we pretty much said that it refers to the connective tissue layer. And that's again true. So it's pertaining to the connective tissue. Then we have our similar villi type of projection here. And within each of these, you're going to see blood vessels and the lymph. And that's green in this picture. So the lymph, which is green in this picture. That is how you absorb your dietary fats. So the lymphatic system will absorb the dietary fats. The bloodstream will absorb the amino acids and the, mono, the monoforms of the carbohydrates. So the simpler forms of carbohydrates, the amino acids will go by way of blood. And the triglycerides, the fats, will go by way of the lymphatic. We also see two major muscles here. The one shown in this direction here is the circular muscle. Another one not shown so well is at the bottom, and that is the longitudinal muscle. So we have a circular muscle and a longitudinal muscle. So one muscle goes in the same direction as the circle, and the other one goes perpendicular, the length of your intestine. So we have a circular muscle, longitudinal muscle. Now when it comes to these muscles, we're again going to use what term? Our little electrical and chemical story here. You can see a little bit of these nerves right here, especially this one, called the myenteric plexus. So yes, there is a nervous system of the gut and that's part of this myenteric plexus, the nervous system of the gut. Okay. So circular, longitudinal. So we have an electrical chemical stimulations of these muscles, circular and longitudinal. So yes, the nervous system and chemicals will play a role in the movement of the food through by way of the muscle, circular and longitudinal. Now these two muscles that I mentioned also go with another term and that goes with what's called motility. Now motility is the rate at which things move through the gut. So if you have a very high motility and very little absorption, that would be basically the definition of diarrhea. If you have low motility and you have very little movement through the gut, then that's going to be your constipation. So high motility will result in diarrhea, low motility will result in constipation. And it does go with this circular and longitudinal. It goes with motility. Next slide. Again, we mentioned this already. Make sure you look at it from the picture point of view. And notice epithelium always goes with what? Gland. Lamina propria goes with connective tissue, areolar tissue. Next slide. Digestive epithelium. So are you telling me, Nemish, that we have different kinds of epithelium along the way, starting from the mouth all the way to the other end? Yes. Next slide. Okay. This is again a general slide. Again, remember I told you that my suggestion to you is that you need to start looking at different areas, what they look like and what they do. This slide would be one of them. The oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus, they're lined with stratified squamous epithelium. Okay. The stomach, small intestine, and most of the large intestine, it's supplied by simple columnar epithelium. So you can see that there is a difference in the epithelial lining depending on where you're at. So this slide is an important one. Next slide. Okay. Now, it turns out that we have not only enzymes being released, but also hormones being released. So as a generic term right now, we have this thing called enteroendocrine. Okay. So the digestive system does have hormones and enzymes involved. Next slide. Lining of the digestive tract. This one I don't care for. Next slide. 
This we do care for. And again, remember, we're going to talk about what I find in the connective tissue. I find nerve endings, blood vessels, lymphatics. We've already talked about those a lot. We also see smooth muscles. These are the same smooth muscles that will be electrically and chemically stimulated. We also see, when we say lymphatic, we see lymphoid tissue. So you're going to have something dealing with your immune system there. Next slide. I don't care for this one. Now I mentioned earlier to you, I said circular muscle, longitudinal muscle. To me, the picture is far more important. Now I also mentioned that the smooth muscles, and again you see elastic fibers here, they are going to be what? Chemically and electrically stimulated. Next slide. We also saw this layer. Now this slide I would definitely write down. So this slide I write down. Keep in mind we're looking at the submucosa. So the picture that goes with it is important. Next slide. Okay, now we have our submucosal plexus. So Nemish, you said a moment ago the brain of the gut. Well that's exactly why I said it. Because this layer contains the nervous system of the gut. It's got sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now the rule of thumb is this. Parasympathetic's job is to move the food through the system. So when you are relaxed and food is properly moving through the system, that's going to be due to parasympathetic. However, when you're stressed out, nervous, not eating right, eating on the run, eating when you're nervous, all of that's going to lead to the sympathetic, like when you're stressed out. And that's going to slow down the movement of the contents through the gut. So sympathetic action may actually slow down the movement, whereas parasympathetic will continue the movement. Next slide. Okay. We've already talked about this to ad nauseum there. We talked about the circular and the longitudinal. Again, we'll see electrical, chemical action with these muscles. And yes, they relate to the word I gave you earlier, motility. Next slide. Okay. Now, I said that there's a brain of the gut. You'll notice down here, sensory, interneurons, motor neurons. If you recall that the spinal cord in 2401 actually had something like this, where you had sensory information going into the spinal cord by way of sensory neurons. Within the spinal cord you had the interneurons, and then coming out of the spinal cord you had the motor neurons. Now, if you learned 2401 well with the nervous system, this S, I, M actually relates to stimulus and effector. And what that relates to is that effectors are what? Muscles or glands. Now that should be a little deja vu for you because you learned that in Biology 2401. That's exactly what we're saying again. So that's why I said that we call this enteric nervous system of your gut to be the brain of the gut. It responds to the stimuli by way of effectors, which are muscles or glands. Next slide. Okay. I've already talked about that one. It is a good idea to keep that term in mind, the myenteric plexus. Again, notice they're harping on what portion? The parasympathetic up here. Okay. Next slide. So it's the parasympathetic that's really moving things along, and it's the sympathetic that's going to gum everything up. Next slide. This is a good term. I've already talked about the serous membrane. Keep that one in general. Okay. Now, if you look at this slide carefully, you see words like what? Smooth muscle, pacemakers, you see words like depolarization, contraction. 
That's because the muscles are very much stimulated by its enteric nervous system to move things along. Next slide. Okay, the top part I don't care too much about. This bottom part is important. Now earlier I gave you this circular layer, the circular muscle, longitudinal muscle. I told you that they play a role in the word motility. And I said that motility is the rate at which things move through the gut. Well, what is the actual physical thing that the circular muscles and the longitudinal muscles create? They create a wave, and that wave is called peristalsis. So if peristalsis is strong, you're going to have a high motility. If peristalsis is slow, you're going to have a slower or, or slow motility. Okay, so those three terms, circular muscle, longitudinal muscle, that's one set, motility, and peristalsis are all related. Okay, now the term at the bottom. When you put food into your mouth, once food is sort of dissolved, chewed up, broken up, and then shoved to the back of your throat, it changes name. So it's no longer called food. It's called bolus. So once you put food in your mouth and it reaches the back of your throat, right around the pharynx, if you remember from the respiratory chapter, they called it oropharynx. We typically call it pharynx proper. Once you get there, it's truly called bolus. Next slide. Now, this slide I am not going to say much about because if you read the slide, you'll see that I have already said it. What words would go down here? Peristalsis. What are the two words I keep harping on? Circular muscle, longitudinal muscle. All of this will relate to motility. Next slide. Here's a picture version of what we've said. So you have a longitudinal muscle, circular muscle, and it's sort of inchworming its way forward. So that's how it actually moves the food forward. That's your peristalsis. Now we do have other movements other than peristalsis, but this is one. The next kind of movement is this one, segmentation. So that's another kind of movement, okay. segmentation. So you could say that the food, this bolus, is being moved in different ways. So we have different kinds of rhythms or patterns being used. So segmentation. Next slide. Now on this one, I'm going to pass this one up, but I just want to let you know that we've already said it. Chemicals, hormones, or those kinds of things will play a role. So, so different hormones will play a role. Different chemicals will play a role. Next slide. Now this slide should already make sense to you. We said neural, and on this slide we see what? neural. Again, we see smooth muscles being mentioned and we see myenteric plexus going with the enteric nervous system. Okay. Again, I'm not going over this slide either. Notice it says, operates entirely outside of the central nervous system. So, operates entirely outside of the nervous system control. Again, we have an S I am story. And remember I said earlier, when you have a stimulus and a response, well, that's part of what? A reflex. So the terms from 2401 are coming back. Here's another story showing you that there are others involved as well. And you learn these from your 2401, your cranial nerves. Next slide. Now, how are you going to get away with knowing just neural? Nemish is 95%, always goes with neural and chemical. So you see hormones involved. Okay. So hormones are released from the digestive system. 
They go all around the body and then they come back and have their effect. Next slide. I don't care too much about this. This picture is basically, basically showing you how hormones down here and the neural system up here regulate movement. This part I've already talked about. Here's the other. So two types of controls are going on for the digestive system. Draw a line. Next slide. Okay, now we're starting in the mouth. So technically all that I've given you so far was just fluff at the beginning of the chapter. Now, starting on page 870, so page 870, you're going to see that we're talk talking about the oral cavity. Now, starting from this point, I'm going to take many of these slides and break it down only into two parts. So starting the oral cavity, two parts. Whatever's going on mechanically and whatever's going on chemically. So mechanically and chemically. We're going to start with this slide. So in the oral cavity, what is happening mechanically? Mechanically, we're doing what? Chewing with our teeth. We are grinding with our teeth. We are using our tongue and our jaws to do what? Mechanically break down the food. We also have lubrication by way of mucus and salivary gland secretions. So mucus and salivary gland secretions, that would go under chemical. And you should be able to make that distinction yourself, mechanical versus chemical. So each one of these will have a chemical and a mechanical. Down here, we're putting it under chemical. We're doing what? Limited digestion. We are breaking down carbohydrates and we are breaking down lipids to a very minimal extent. It's a very minimal extent. A good example of that is your cracker. The moment you eat a cracker and you put it in your mouth and it dissolves, we are actually breaking down the carbohydrates, the starch in the mouth. So there are chemicals in the salivary gland that are going to break down starch for you. Same way for lipids, but lipids will be very minimal breakdown. Next slide. Okay, we've already talked about this lining. We talked about stratified squamous in a previous slide. Okay. We already know that we're going to have some lipid soluble underneath the tongue because it's very vascular. That's why they have drugs that are designed to go and be absorbed from underneath the tongue. Okay. Okay. Don't care for the rest. Next slide. Don't care for that slide. Don't really care too much for that slide. I do want you to be having a general feel for this picture. So I have a general feel for this picture. Next slide. Okay. This picture, again, a general feel. Next slide. For tongue, on this one, I want you to be aware of, again, I'm breaking it down to two parts only. Mechanically, this is what the tongue does for you. Compression, abrasion, and distortion it helps us move the food around. So number one and number two will go under mechanical. The only one for me under chemical is this one down here, linguinal lipase. So this is a minimal breakdown of your fat. Very minimal breakdown. So number four belongs to chemical, one and two belongs to mechanical. Next slide. Okay, now I do want you to know these three salivary glands. There is a picture for them. So I do know that these three salivary glands. Okay, okay now Remember, we're still breaking it down into mechanical and chemical. This is the chemical that I want you to write down under oral cavity. 
So remember the big heading and either mechanical or chemical. So oral cavity, chemical will be salivary amylase. It breaks down the carbohydrates, the starch for you. So that's important. Next slide. So if you've not noticed, one last time, I'm going to take the big heading up here and I'm going to give you the mechanical aspect and the chemical aspect as we go along. So I want you to know those three and this is the one we're currently on with salivary amylase. Next slide. And this one, all I care is mucus because that's what? A chemical. So mucus under chemical. Next slide. Again, what do I have? Mucus, salivary amylase. Here's the picture version of the three salivary glands. So make sure you know where they are. So the three salivary glands. I really don't care too much about that picture. Next slide. And now we're on saliva. Okay. Saliva. This picture is important. It lets you know who produces the most saliva for you. The submandibular gland makes up most of the saliva. So this slide is important. Next slide. This slide is important. So you know that most of saliva is what? water. So most of saliva is water. What kind of things do I find in saliva? I find electrolytes, buffers, mucus or mucin, antibodies, enzymes, and waste. Why antibodies? Well, that's why a dog licks its wound. The saliva has your immune system in it. There are things in your saliva that fight germs. We typically call them lysosomes. Okay, lysozymes, lysosomes. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so now again, where are we still? Oral cavity. What do we see here? Lubrication, that's going to be what? A mechanical process. Okay, so mechanical for lubrication. We already talked about this one the salivary amylase. So again, that's under the chemical aspect. Next slide. Okay. Now, this slide I want you to keep in mind for sure, and that is salivation is under neural control. So salivation is under neural control. So when your mouth starts to salivate because you see something that tastes really good and you know it and smells good, you start to salivate. So salivation is under neural control. Now please note, it's parasympathetic. That's because the actual thought of food or having food in your mouth that starts the salivation process. So the thought of food or active food in your mouth will cause salivation and that's going to start a lot of other processes moving forward. So if you don't eat, but you go through window shopping for that little pastry cake, as you're looking at that cake in the window and it's starting to taste good and look good, you're going to start to salivate. So whether you have food in the mouth or not, the thought of food will cause that salivation. It will start the rest of the process to move forward. Next slide. Teeth. So now we move to oral cavity, teeth. What do you think teeth are going to do? Chew, masticate. Okay, so chew, masticate. That's going to belong to what? The mechanical. Next slide. Okay, I don't care about the teeth, so the teeth will not be on my exam. So I'm passing those up. Now, when it comes to knowing how many teeth you have, this slide I still consider important. You should know this as a general rule. Incisors, cuspids, bicuspids, and then the molars. 
What they do, I don't really care for. Next slide. Now, how many teeth you have? How many baby teeth? How many adult teeth? Overall, this slide I care for because that you should know. So we have ter uh, 32 permanent teeth. Right, so 32 permanent teeth. Eight on each side, upper and lower. So this slide I do care for. Next slide. So this slide is important. Don't care for that. This is a nice little general picture showing you how you had your baby teeth here and you see the new teeth starting to grow and develop and they're starting to re really come in. So you can see these teeth starting to come in here. Okay. So you have your upper row of teeth followed by the baby teeth. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, next picture. We already talked about mastication. Okay. So that goes under chewing, goes under mechanical. I don't care for the rest of this. <clears throat> now we're on pharynx. Now the pharynx, this slide is very important. Notice it is the passageway that we talked about, which is common with the respiratory chapter as well. We have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngeopharynx. And we've already talked about this down here as well. Food passes through the oropharynx and the larynx and then to the esophagus. So this slide is important. Now, notice we've moved from pharynx to esophagus. The author will move these slides forward, but we're going to backtrack in a little while to actually fill in what they do. Now this general slide you should have an idea of, don't care too much about it, but you should have an idea of where it is. Next slide. Don't care for this slide. Next slide. We've already talked about this. Remember how I said as we move further down, in this case we're still having what? Stratified squamous epithelial. So this, that part would be important. Next slide. Okay, now, this is where you have your chemical and physical back. In the esophagus, we have our, our movement, that's going to be our mechanical. But we also have what in the esophagus? Mucus, that's your chemical. Okay. Notice what we're calling it. We're calling it a bolus. Because remember, we've already passed up what, according to the author thus far. We passed up the pharynx, so now food is considered bolus. The moment you go from the or oropharynx downward, we're looking at bolus. Here's a picture version. Don't care too much for that one. This one's a little bit better. Next slide. Now this one is important. This is going to be part of our mechanical process. So we're in the esophagus for mechanical and we have swallowing, also called deglutition. So swallowing, deglutition. Now it says it can be initiated voluntarily. That's because we actually have three phases. I'm going to use what the author has provided so that therefore there's no confusion between books. Now the buccal phase or the cheek phase is the part that you're moving the food from the true mouth to and towards the oropharynx. So the buccal phase is like the cheek phase and that's considered voluntary. So this part right here, the buccal phase will be voluntary. Then the pharyngeal, the initial part of the pharyngeal is voluntary, but then the second and in this case the esophagus now shown all that is involuntary. Now to show you a picture version of what I've said, we now see it here. So you can see that I'm moving this 
buccal phase, I'm moving the bolus towards the oropharynx. That's going to be voluntary. Then I have the pharyngeal phase, that's involuntary. And then I have the esophagus or esophageal, and that's of course involuntary. Now, see how the author in this slide has used the word peristalsis the moment I mention esophagus? That is true among all books and among all tests. So whenever I say starting with the esophagus, you know that you've already had your last involuntary stage. So you had your last involuntary stage and now what will start to kick in as movement all the way down to the anus? Peristalsis. So esophagus to anus is peristalsis movement. Okay, that takes care of the first three. Now number four down here. We see that the bolus is now ready to enter the stomach. But it has to pass a valve. And that valve is called lower esophageal sphincter. And you should know by now that a sphincter is a ringed muscle from Biology 2401. So lower esophageal sphincter is that sphincter that opens up to let the food into the stomach. Now, that same sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter, if it's irritated and has a spasm, the stomach acids of the stomach itself can actually cause the vapors to go into the esophagus, giving you what is commonly called a heartburn. So when you have a heartburn, you're actually getting the esophagus irritated by the acids of the stomach. Okay, now, the author goes into each one of these in detail starting with this slide. I have given you my version already. Notice the author says the same thing. Once the bolus enters the oropharynx, it's ready to move down. So once the bolus enters the oropharynx, it's ready to move down. This part right here is going to be voluntary. The expanded version down here says the same thing. Next, we have the esophagus phase. And notice the author says exactly that. Once in the esophagus, the bolus is pushed toward the stomach by a peristaltic wave. And we've already talked about this one. Next slide. Okay, now you can see that once we pass that lower esophageal sphincter, we're now starting to move and talk about the stomach. Now, at this point, you should have the different items by the blue banner. So we had different topics up here thus far with the blue banner. Each one of them had a structure with that was either a chem chemical aspect or a mechanical aspect or both. And so I'm going to continue that same process. Now we're in the stomach. Now what is the stomach going to do? This is now going to fall into our mechanical story. The stomach is going to break down the food inside mechanically by grinding it. So your stomach is actually a concrete barrel that you often see on those concrete trucks that always are constantly spinning. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're rotating, grinding, moving our stomach. So yes, the stomach will have muscles that do the same type of thing. Then we see chemicals here. So the stomach will have a chemical story as well. So we have enzymes and hormones and all that coming from the stomach as well. Next slide. Now instead of worrying about this picture, this slide, I'm going to move to the next one. These are now the parts of the stomach. So you have the cardia, of course, there's going to be a part towards the heart. The fundus, which is the top of the stomach. So the top of the stomach is fundus. The body. And then we have an area called the pylorus, which is at the bottom end of the stomach. Now the stomach is positioned as a J-shaped organ. Now where are you going to best see this? 
on lab day when you actually touch the torso model. Now what does the stomach going to look like? The stomach is going to look like this. That is why it's best to touch the stomach. We said earlier the top portion is the fundus. That part is the cardia because it faces towards the heart. This is the body part and then we have our pyloric area down here. Now we're going to talk about this picture. First we see that the heart has three layers. We've already talked about longitudinal, we've already talked about circular, but notice it also has an oblique layer. So your stomach is not only grinding and moving as a circular fashion, and not only a longitudinal fashion, but it's sort of a twisty motion as well. We also have these folds in the stomach. These folds in the stomach are called rugae. So the folds in the stomach are called rugae. We'll see that the stomach has multiple linings in its layers, very much like what we've seen. And we see the pyloric sphincter at the bottom end. Now once I pass this pyloric sphincter, I've entered the first segment of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. Some people pronounce it duodenum, same thing. So the first segment of the small intestine is the duodenum or duodenum. Now this pyloric sphincter has an important role. That sphincter is going to be our gate to determine whether we're ready to move the food further down or not. So once you swallow your food, it goes down the three phases we saw. The stomach's going to grind, mix, chemicals are going to go in there. You're going to chew up your food by way of the stomach, and then it's, it's going to be ready to move further down. It's going to be a hormonal control and an electrical control that's going to control how well the food moves down and when the food moves down. Okay? So that when is an important. One of the things you're going to learn as we go through this chapter is that there is an anticipation story. So we always are going to do what? Have the materials ready in anticipation of what's headed our way. So even though we're now talking about the stomach, everything that we're now talking about has already been preset the moment you put food into your mouth. Now let me say that one last time so you got, got that down. Emish, are you telling me that the stomach has already started doing its thing the moment I put food into my mouth? That's exactly what it says. So the moment the food goes into your mouth, the stomach is anticipating everything, getting everything ready. So what do you think is going to happen to this pyloric sphincter right here. It is going to open and when it gets ready to open we've already done what? Everything further downstream has already gotten ready even before the food moves there. Okay? So even before the move, food moves there we're going to anticipate and have everything ready in advance. Next slide. This slide is for your perusing. I've already talked about it. This slide is important, but I'd rather do it by way of a picture that's coming up. I'm going to quickly talk about it anyway. The epithelial has mucus. So what do you think that's going to go under? Your chemical. So stomach, chemical. Are you now noticing that even the epithelial has changed? The stomach now has simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so simple columnar epithelial. And that should tell you something. When you change that structure from stratified squamous epithelial to now simple columnar epithelial, we're doing what? We're getting things ready. Things are changing. So here we have under chemical mucus. This mucus is a unique mucus in that it actually protects the stomach against its own acid. So it produces a special mucus to protect it against its own acid. We also have gastric pits that we'll see 
that do other functions. Next slide. Now here are the cells that are part of that gastric pit. So these are the cells part of the gastric pit. We have the parietal cells and we have the chief cells. So parietal cells, chief cells. Now these cells play a very important role. So these cells play a very important role. I'm going to start with the chief cells that you see at the bottom there. The chief cells are the most abundant as part of our gastric pit. And what do they do? They produce pepsinogen. Okay, so they'll produce pepsinogen. We'll talk about that in a moment a little bit more. So pepsinogen. That's the chief cell. Those parietal cells that you see on the side, also listed, the parietal cells will play a role in the production of HCL. They'll play a role in the production of HCL. That's your hydrochloric acid. So parietal cells, HCL, hydrochloric acid, chief cells will be pepsinogen. Next slide. Here's a view from page 880 showing you the gastric pits, the cells that are going to be within them. So again, we're looking at mucosa. That should make sense because it's got to be epithelial. So all of this top right here is all epithelial, even labeled for you here. So all of this is your epithelial containing the special cells producing HCL and pepsinogen. Next slide. Here's an enlarged view showing you the parietal cells for HCL and the chief cells for pepsinogen. Next slide. This is what I've already said. I just want to give it to you as a slide. Parietal cells producing HCL, chief cells producing pepsinogen. Now the body's pretty smart. It does not waste the chemical. It puts it out as an inactive form. So our inactive form is pepsinogen. Now the magical thing about HCL is that HCL actually stimulates pepsinogen to convert to pepsin. So HCL will help in the conversion of pepsinogen into pepsin. Now pepsin is a proteolytic, which means it breaks down proteins. So you now see for the first time that protein breakdown is primarily starting in the stomach. When we were in the mouth earlier, we only saw what two things? Carbohydrates, minimal, and we saw lipids, minimal. This is the first time that we're really breaking down the proteins. Next slide. This picture shows you how we produce HCL. We don't go to some neighboring store to, to go get the HCL. We actually produce the HCL using our blood and stomach relationship. So the blood and stomach relationship will play a role. Now if you look at box number one, you see something that was mentioned in chapter 23, respiration. It's the same enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. Same story even plays a role here. So same thing. So we are producing our own HCL HCL by getting the CL from the blood and taking our carbon dioxide and converting it and spitting out our H. So you are actually regulating your blood by regulating the production of your stomach acid. So your stomach acid does relate to the regulation of your blood's pH. Okay, so that's important. This slide, very, very important. 
Next slide. This slide I've already talked about, so I can pass it up. HCL, stimulating the production of pepsin. Next. We have G cells and we have D cells. They're also part of that gastric pit. Now, so far I've mentioned enzymes to you. This is the first time I'm actually mentioning a hormone here. So G cells produce gastrin. Now gastrin is your trend setter hormone for setting your motility. Now Nimish, you've used that term before. That's exactly right. Gastrin is going to be the hormone that regulates motility. It's going to set the rhythm, the rate at which things move through that motility, that peristalsis, all of that is controlled by gastrin. Okay, D cells is a hormone that inhibits the release of gastrin. So these two are opposites of each other. They are your negative feedback system that we often talk about. Next slide. Now, this slide is an important one. And it often is accompanied by a picture, which you'll see on the next slide. Now, this slide right here, or this one that we're looking at now, talks about the three phases. The cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. These three phases are dealing with what two things up here? The nervous system and hormones. So when you're regulating the production of an acid, and the movement of the food, it's done by this. So gastric, cephalic, intestinal. Let's look at them. Here's your first picture. This is the cephalic phase. So the page I'm on is page 884. So page 884. Now, here we have cephalic pertaining to the brain, the head. Here's food. Notice it's the sight of food, the smell of food, the taste of food, or even the thought of food. So sight, smell, taste, or thought. What will it do? It's going to stimulate the vagus nerve. Now remember, vagus nerve is very much a parasympathetic cranial nerve, right? Parasympathetic. Notice what it's doing for you. Mucus cells, producing mucus. Now remember, the food hasn't even arrived there. It's just the thought of food, the taste of food, the smell of food, or whatever. We're just getting our stomach ready. Chief cells producing pepsinogen, parietal cells producing HCL. And then we have our G cells producing gastrin. Now gastrin is going to be the one that is going to be a stimulatory effect. It's going to say, all right, Start turning, start grinding, start moving. And notice it even controls what? Moving through the pyloric sphincter. Because either there is food in your mouth, there is food in your stomach, and if there's food in your stomach, we need to do what? Move it ready further down. So that's the cephalic part. Next, this slide is the gastric phase. In this one, we do have food in the stomach. So the previous one assumed there was food. Here we actually have food in the stomach. Food, when it comes into the stomach, now, once it comes into the stomach, it's going to stretch the stomach. So it's going to stretch the stomach. That's going to cause distension. And it's going to tell the brain, hey, no more food in the stomach because food, stomach is full, right? Stomach is full, so the stomach is going to distend and tell the brain, hey, stop eating. That is why some people get stomach st stapled or clipped or stomach small, you know, shrunken a little bit, just to do what? Curb themselves from eating because their stomach is stapled, they've got a smaller stomach now because they've got a bisection done, so we have a distension. 
The stretching causes stretch receptors and the brain was told to stop eating. Elevated pH. Once you put food in your stomach, the pH is going to go up. It's now going to be basic. That's going to tell the brain to do what? Food is in the stomach. Start kicking out the enzymes. And as you can see, it does that. It tells the stomach to start spitting out all of this stuff. So elevated pH and distension is going to cause the stomach to produce all of this. Then we have proteins, partially digested proteins. That's going to cause gastrin to say, okay, we are pretty much done with our chewing. We need to start moving things a little bit further. So gastrin will promote this. Gastrin will promote that, shown by these aqua colored arrows. And then we also see mixing and waving here. So we're just going to have stuff as enzymes and hormones, and we're going to start churning, churning, mixing, grinding, and the stomach is going to do its job of breaking food down. And we're almost ready to do what? Move it further down. Now remember, gastrin is a hormone, so it must go by way of the bloodstream. So gastrin is a hormone. It does it by way of bloodstream. Now there's one thing I need to mention before we go any further. Once we are in the stomach, it is no longer called bolus. It is called chyme. C-H-Y-M-E. So the contents of the stomach are now going to be called chyme. C-H-Y-M-E. Next slide. Now, once we're basically told to stop, what's going to happen? We're going to start doing what? Stretching the duodenum. When you stretch the duodenum, you're basically telling the stomach, hey, I've already gotten your stuff. I already got the stuff coming towards me, towards the duodenum, through the pyloric sphincter. You can stop doing what? You can stop churning out more pepsin. You can stop churning out more HCL. And you can also do what to your peristalsis in the stomach portion? You can stop the peristalsis there too. Because food has already dumped into the duodenum. Now the duodenum has its own hormones. Now how do I know that these are hormones? Because they travel by way of the bloodstream. So they're traveling by way of the blood. The first one we have is CCK. CCK stands for cholecystokinin. Okay, so cholecystokinin. It's coming from the small intestine here. And notice it says, in the presence of lipids and carbohydrates, we're going to promote CCK. Okay, so CCK, cholecystokinin. Now, not mentioned here, but again, remember, we are anticipating. So what do you think CCK is going to do above and beyond what's shown on this slide? By turning that off, that off, that off. If it's turning these off, what will it be turning on? It is actually going to turn on the pancreatic juices from the pancreas. So it's going to CCK. It's not shown on this slide, but it's coming up. So CCK will promote pancreatic juices from the pancreas. The next one I want to talk about is secretin. Remember, we have all this stomach acid coming in. We need to do what? All that stomach acid that's coming in is going to cause a, hot, a very strong burning of the duodenum if we don't neutralize all that acidic pH. So secretin is actually going to neutralize the pH in the small intestine. So secretin's job is to neutralize the pH in the small intestine. So it's neutralizing the chyme in the small intestine. Now it does that how? 
I mean, it doesn't have a spray that it neutralizes. How do I neutralize hydrogen ions? By binding them with bicarbonate ions. So what are we going to do to neutralize that stomach acid, which is now in the small intestine? We're going to dump bicarbonate ions into the lumen of the small intestine. We're going to neutralize it. Okay, continuing with this slide, still in the stomach. Now much of what I've said is now going to happen within that stomach towards the small intestine. Now we've already mentioned that the stomach has all those other hormones and all, but I want you to understand that the stomach does also have salivary amylase and a little bit of linguinal lipase type of thing. So we've already talked about these two earlier. Notice what the slide says. Stomach performs preliminary. We've already broken them down. So we're going to break them down a little bit further. Next slide. Now, this is what happens as we're doing this. Stomach contents becomes more fluidy. Because remember, we're dumping all these enzymes in. We're dumping on We're act, having hormones act there. All that's happening pH is now going to become very acidic, about 2.0. So stomach acidity is now about 2.0. What are we going to do in the stomach? Pepsin activity. If pepsin goes up, proteins are of course being broken down. Now it says, although digestion occurs in the stomach, nutrients are not absorbed here. Now there is two exceptions here. One is alcohol. The stomach does have the ability to absorb alcohol. So that's one exception to this slide. The other is water. There is some absorption of water directly from the stomach. So water absorption and there's alcohol absorption. And of course some drugs can also be absorbed by way of the stomach too. So this is a catch-all but there are a couple exceptions. Next slide small intestine. So we're now moving into the duodenal area, the small intestine. What does the small intestine do? Plays the most important role in digestion and absorption. This slide says 90 percent of the nutrient absorption occurs in the small intestine. That is true. So 90 percent of the absorption is going to occur there. Now let me expand on that. The small intestine is broken down into three parts the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Now, even though it says 90% in the small intestine, when you break it down, it's the duodenum and primarily the jejunum that does the absorption. So duodenum and the jejunum. The ileum, on the other hand, is very poor in absorption. So basically, if you don't get most of your nutrients absorbed in the first two, the duodenum and the jejunum, pretty much after that, you're not going to absorb much. Next slide. Okay. I don't care for all of this up here. I do care for the bottom part. So what is the function of the, day of the duodenum? To receive chyme, and I've already given you that. What else does the duodenum do? neutralize the acid before they can damage those special absorptive cells. And we've already seen that too. That's where secretin will come in and play a role. Next slide. The jejunum. I've already told you about this. It is the location of most chemical digestion and nutrient absorption. And I've already mentioned that. So this is where most of it. So if you had to say duodenum and jejunum, among those two, it's jejunum. Out of all three, it's still jejunum, but most of the absorption is occurring where? Jejunum and the duodenum. Very little in the ileum. Next slide. This is the ileum portion. Now at the ileum, at the end of the ileum, we have a valve called the ileo Cecal valve. Now the name has changed. Long ago it was called a, a sphincter. They even call it a sphincter down here too, but the name officially has changed to ileocecal valve. 
even though it's a sphincter. Now this valve, once you pass it, you enter the cecum. So once you pass the ileocecal valve, you're now in the cecum, which means you've gone from small intestine to large intestine. You've also changed the name. The name now goes from chyme to feces. So once you're in the cecum, once you're in the large intestine, it is now feces. Next slide. Here's a picture that you must look at. So here's our duodenum. A lot of people call it a U-shaped looking thing. Here's our jejunum where most of our absorption will occur and most of our digestion. And here's the ileum. And right here, right close to that appendix there, right next to that appendix, right here is your ileocecal valve. This part right here would be the cecum, and then we have our different portions of the overall large intestine. Next slide. Okay, this slide, again, I want you to notice that now that we're in the small intestine, we still have what? Simple columnar epithelium. So simple columnar epithelium. Next slide. Now the small intestine does have enzymes. So the small intestine does have enzymes. Again, we have our mechanical and chemical story back again. So we have our mucus and we have our enzymes coming from the small intestine. This slide is important. Don't really care for that slide. I do care for this one, so this is an important one. Now, does this, 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 this one look similar to the one we saw before? Yes. So again, we see something that we saw before. Here's our epithelial. This time we have long finger-like projections called villi. Villus is singular, villi is plural. We also see our little lymph nodules here that we'll see later. If you recall, I mentioned something like Peyer's patches for our lymphatic chapter. Well, that's what this is going to be related to, our Peyer's patches, one of our fixed macrophages, but for the intestinal area. Okay, so this picture to keep in mind. Here's the enlarged view of what I've said before. The blood vessels here will pick up the carbohydrates in their simplest form and the amino acids. The lymphatics, as we saw before, these lacteals as they call them, these lacteals will pick up the triglycerides. Here's a micrograph view of the same thing. Next slide. This slide, don't care for. We've already talked about the brush border. And these are now the enzymes. Now, the next few slides are important to understand that these are enzymes coming from where? Coming from the intestinal lining itself. Now, the key one to keep in mind is this one right here, enteropeptidase. Some people call it enterokinase. So on a test, you might see this one listed as enterokinase. That is important. Now, what does it do? What does this enteropeptidase or enterokinase do? It activates the trypsinogen. Now, let's not get confused here. We said that CCK, that's coming from this small intestine itself, is going to tell the pancreas to release enzymes. Yes, pancreas will bring enzymes to this duodenal region. One of the key enzymes is called trypsinogen, and you have to activate it before it's ready. So this enteropeptidase, or what I call enterokinase, will activate trypsinogen. These we've already seen before. So gastrin, CCK, cholecystokinin, and secretin. 
So this is why I'm saying put them on flashcards. So it would be a good idea to put these enzymes and hormones, these are hormones down here, put them on flashcards. Next slide. Duodenal, I don't care too much about this, but just understand that we're producing a lot of mucus in the intestine, especially in the duodenum. Next slide. This slide is important. Remember, again, chemical. Moisten the chyme and buffer the acids. And we've already talked about that. Okay, so buffering the acids and moistening the chyme. So we have a lot of water there. Next. Again, you see what kind of language. Parasympathetic will accelerate the movement. It's under enteric nervous system. And chyme will now move into the duodenum and a little bit further down. Next slide. Now this slide is important because you need to know what kind of reflexes. Now anytime we have a reflex story, you know that you're responding to something. So the gastroenteric reflex stimulates motility and secretion all entire small intestine. That means that the moment you put food into your stomach, it's going to start moving whatever's already in the small intestine further down. So that's the top part. So the top part says that the moment I put stuff in the stomach, again, remember that word anticipation. So the once I move food into the stomach, whatever's in the stomach needs to move further down. Same is true for this one. Whatever is in the stomach is going to cause whatever is in the ileum to move further down. Remember, we've got, to, we've got to make space, so we have to move things down. So the gastroiliac reflex means once I put stuff in the stomach, it's going to want to shove things from the ileum further down. So from the small intestine into the large intestine. Now, have you experienced that? Some people are very sensitive to this, such as breakfast in the morning. Some people can't go until they eat breakfast. Once they eat breakfast in the morning, it starts to move. So once they have food going into their stomach by way of breakfast, it starts making the bowel movements move further along. That is what I showed you with this slide a moment ago. So the moment I have stuff in my stomach, it's going to force things to move further down. Next slide. This is on page 885. Okay, so page 885. It is a very th good thing to look at this page. So having stuff in the stomach is actually going to move things further down. Next slide. Now, all this time that we've been talking about getting stuff from the stomach, into the small intestine, we've never mentioned the pancreas. Well, now we see pancreas involved because once we have got ourselves into the U-shaped portion called the duodenum, we're going to say, hey, we need to have chemicals get to that duodenum from the pancreas. Next slide. Okay. I don't care for that. Next slide. Now, this part is important, but not the whole thing. What's really important is this part down here. This pancreatic acini, or acini. Those cells are not the same cells you saw in chapter 18 for the islet of Langerhans. The ones with the alpha cells, the beta cells, they're not the ones for insulin and glucagon. These are your exocrine cells. These are the ones that make the secretions to help digest your food. So these pancreatic cells, special cells in the pancreas, they're exocrine. That means they're going to travel by way of ducts. You learned that before. So pancreatic ducts, that's going to cause the enzymes to go down the pancreatic duct 
to the U-shaped portion of your duodenum. To get a better representation of what it looks like in terms of the pancreas, here we have a picture of the pancreas showing the pancreatic duct. Now the pancreatic duct branches off here and we see those two pieces here. And what's going to go down that pancreatic duct? Your pancreatic enzymes to help break down your food. Now earlier we saw CCK in a picture showing the upper portion, the duodenum, releasing from the small intestine, because CCK is a hormone coming from the small intestine, telling the stomach to do things, that's what we saw before. But CCK also tells the pancreas to produce more pancreatic juices. So these pancreatic juices, because of a stimulation of CCK, is going to cause pancreatic juices to come out. Now we have two lines here. We have the accessory pancreatic duct and the main portion here, the duodenal papilla here. We also see a green line going up, and you can see it here, the green line goes up into the liver and the gallbladder right here. Now, CCK, as I've said, stimulates the pancreatic juices to come from the pancreas. But CCK also plays a role in stimulating the gallbladder to release bile. So even though in the previous picture we saw CCK doing things, now I'm telling you that CCK also plays a role in stimulating gallbladder release from, or bile release from the gallbladder. Let me put it that way. So releasing bile from the gallbladder. So what will happen? Bile will come out of the gallbladder and come down the common bile duct into this region and I call this area the famous cutout region because pretty much everything and everything has to happen there. Because remember, we can't wait to break stuff down because the jejunum is actually waiting for all this to be broken down so it can do most of the absorbing that we've already seen. So what will CCK do? Promote pancreatic juices to come into this cutout region and bile to get there. Now what will bile do? Bile contains materials we call bile salts. Bile salts are like detergents. They help break down the fatty materials. So those triglycerides that you eat, all of that needs to be broken down. It's done through a process called emulsification. We will see that in a slide form shortly. I'm showing it and mentioning it now because it's going to come up. Okay, so our main goal in this cutout region is to have all the things ready. Again, anticipation. Next slide. Now, we've already talked about this, so I'm going to pass this up. Remember, it's the exocrine dealing with the pancreatic juices. Next slide. I'm going to pass that up. This slide. Now this slide is important. These are the pancreatic juices that I've been talking about. So it has enzymes to further break down proteins. It has nucleases. Why would you want nucleases? Well, when you eat a plant, you're eating plant DNA. When you're eating meat, you're eating an animal DNA. So you have to break down the DNA of a plant or an animal and you have nucleases to do that with. Then we have pancreatic lipase. Remember in the tongue or in the mouth we had our linguinal lipase and I told you it's a minimal breakdown. Same way here. We have a minimal breakdown by way of pancreatic lipase. All right. Now, I did not mention, because the slides did not mention, but in the stomach we have gastric lipase, but why authors didn't mention, and I did not either, is because gastric lipase is a minimal effect there as well. Then we have pancreatic amylase, which further breaks down the carbohydrates. So we have carbohydrate, fat, DNA, and protein breakdown. 
That is why all these things need to be in that cutout region. Next slide. These are the things I just relayed to you. So I told you that amylase breaks down the starches, lipase breaks down the fats, nucleases will break down the DNA, and the peptidases, and these are important terms, peptidase, protease break down the proteins from larger ones into smaller ones. These are primarily activated once they reach what? The small intestine. Okay. Now earlier we talked about enterokinase, we talked about trypsinogen, well that's what we're going to go back to. Next slide. Liver, I don't care for this for this chapter. Next slide, don't care for that. I do care for this picture because you will see it on lab day. So this picture is important. Next slide. This picture is important because you'll see this on a lab day. Next slide. I really don't care too much for this picture. Now, this part right here is something you had or should have had in chapter 21, the hepatic portal system. That is what takes all the dirty stuff of your blood and cleans it by way of the liver. So you see there is a blood flow going there. Because remember, when you eat at the Golden Arches and you're eating dirty food, you need to be able to purify the food that you eat, and it goes through the liver for that purpose. Don't care for that. Don't care for that. Okay. Don't care for that. I do care for this. I mentioned Kufr cells when we talked about the liver as a fixed macrophage. So this is your rehash of that. Next slide. Okay, this part I have mentioned. We talked about the liver and bile. Next couple slides are going to mention what bile is all about. Okay. So we talked about the common hepatic duct. We talked about the common bile duct and cystic duct. These were all in picture form a moment ago. Here's another one that goes with it. So again, we see common bile duct. We already saw a common bile duct meeting who? The pancreatic duct. Next slide. So this is the story that we saw earlier with a different picture. Here's our pancreatic duct. Here's our common bile duct. And it goes into this region right here. Next slide. Now this slide is an important one. Look what it says. The liver secretes bile. So that's what this is. The bile will then go into the gallbladder. So bile will go into the gallbladder. As we've already said, it's going to be released by way of CCK. So CCK will stimulate the release of bile from the gallbladder and it'll go into that cutout region we keep talking about. Now, this line right here is important. It's called hepatopancreatic sphincter. Some people call it hepatopancreatic ampulla. To me, one and the same. So hepatopancreatic sphincter, or hepatopancreatic ampulla. What will it provide? It will provide bile. Now, what's in bile? I said earlier, I said earlier that bile has bile salts. What will bile salts do? Break down the large fat droplets into small ones called, the process is called emulsification. So very much like your dishwashing liquid that you put into your oily casserole pan. The moment you see those big fat droplets and you add a drop of soap to it, it breaks it apart into smaller pieces. 
That is exactly what we're doing here. So emulsification by way of bile salts, breaking larger fat droplets into tiny ones. Next slide. So this slide's important. What does the liver do? This one is important. Write it as is. The next slide's better. These are all the functions of the liver. I would definitely put these on flashcards. So this was the first portion. This was the second portion. So put those on a flashcard, the functions of the liver. Okay. This part we've already seen before. We saw all of this before in chapter 19. Next slide. Okay. So this is a rehash of that other one. So this one here is related to this one. Okay, so it's a repeat. Next slide. Now, largest blood reservoir in the body, that's the liver. So next to the brain and the heart, you got a whole lot of blood wear in the liver. So the liver has a lot of blood flow. So brain, heart, liver, kidney, that type of thing. Liver contains a lot of blood. This slide, functions of liver, okay, they're important as well. So you can see you have three main categories for the functions of the liver, and each category has a lot of functions within it. So what I would do to make sure we have it straight is I would start off with that slide and then break the slide off into its own flashcards. So that would be one. That would be the other, and then this is the last one. Now, this slide is important. Dietary lipids are not water-soluble. Pancreatic lipase is not lipid-soluble. So what do I have to use? I have to use bile salts by way of emulsification to break them down into tiny droplets. So that's important. So this slide is important. Next slide. I just want you to know what a gallbladder is and where it is. I don't care for that slide as much. Don't care for that one. This one, you do need to know. Now, if you don't know it from this slide, I don't care, but I really care for the picture, which we've already looked at. So be aware of the picture, if not this slide. Okay, next slide. This, we've already talked about. So CCK. CCK will do what? Release bile from the gallbladder. So release bile from the gallbladder. Okay, next slide. Okay. Now, I keep talking about bile salts, bile salts, but there are other things in bile as well. Now keep in mind that bile will contain things like bilirubin. Okay. Will contain things that are going to be going with that word stercobilin that you saw before, which gives feces its characteristic color. Okay. So all of that will come into play. But why bile salts? Because that's the only key thing that is actually a digestive process. Everything else is simply going along for the ride. It's simply a waste. Now, going to this slide. We've talked about it. Again, you see what key words here. Neural and hormonal. Basically, Nemesh is electrical and chemical. That's how we're controlling these enzymes. Next slide. Uh, this slide, don't care for. Okay, let me back up for one second. I've said it often, doesn't need to be said again, but I'll say it anyway. Remember, the true activity of food moving through the digestive is parasympathetic. If you wanted to inhibit that, then that would be a sympathetic. So sympathetic, in this case, will slow the gut down, 
parasympathetic will move it along. Okay. Don't care for that slide? Okay, this slide is important. This is a list of all the hormones that we've pretty much handled so far. The main ones for me on this slide are gastrin, secretin, gastric inhibitory peptide, and CCK. Those are the main ones for me. The next few slides are related to just that. So this tells you what gastrin does, which I've already given you an overview. Remember I said gastrin plays a role in motility. So that's a key thing there. Secretin, what did secretin do? It neutralizes the pH, right? Then we have CCK story here that we've already talked about. I don't care for these two. And now here is a summary chart. So this is a nice picture to keep in mind. So these are the key hormones and what they do. Okay, so this page, this slide is important. Next slide. Now this one is moving our story forward. It is an important one. It takes about five hours for materials to pass from duodenum to the end of the ileum. So that's why once you eat something and within the next five hours you're feeling sick, well then you know why. Because it's something you ate. Okay. Okay, so this is a general picture to keep in mind. Again, you see words like stir and mix, which go with our mechanical story. Okay, now, that takes care of that portion. Now we're moving to the large intestine. Now, I don't want you to worry about that slide, but I do want you to understand a subtle difference here. Even though majority of the absorption and digestion are occurring in the small intestine, the goal of the large intestine is pretty much water absorption. Now what do I mean by that? The leftover water. So the key role for the large intestine is to absorb water, which is the leftover water. It's also, its purpose is to do what? Form feces. Remember earlier I said, once I pass the ileocecal valve, the, ter the term chyme, so chyme turns into feces. Okay, so chyme will turn into feces. So formation of feces. And what is feces? Nothing more than dried up chyme. So the large intestine's job is really to simply remove the water. Dried up chyme, basically feces. The other purpose of the large intestine is vitamin K. Now you learned that in the lymphatic chapter, or rather, rather the blood chapter. So in the blood chapter you learned about vitamin K. And vitamin K was important for making clotting factors. So you're going to see that coming up. Next slide. So again, what do you see as my comment? Same thing. Matter of fact, the author's done a really good job here. Large intestine's main role is to reabsorb the leftover water. Its goal is to form feces by drying up that. And we have vitamins involved, and those vitamins are such as vitamin K. And, of course, to hold and store the fecal matter in the rectum prior to defecation. So this slide is the summary I just gave you. Next slide. I really don't care for that slide. Don't really care for that, we've already talked about it. The appendix. Understand it's a vestigial organ. It is a lymph node. So if you have an inflammation like a tonsil inflamed in your mouth, what do you do? You get the tonsil removed. Well, if you have a lymph node swollen, in the case of an appendix, what do you do? You get the appendix removed. Same thing. Okay. Colon. I don't care for the overall slide, but I do care for that word. So I want to make sure you know what that word is and can you identify it on a model or a slide or whatnot. So that term is important. Next. Okay. That term is important. 
Okay, so that term is important. Next line. Don't care for that. Okay, this is important. Know the different segments of the large intestine. So we have the ascending, and notice this would be part including what? The cecum. So the cecum is actually part of this. So we have cecum included in the ascending, then the transverse, descending, sigmoid. Next, we have it broken down a little bit further. So these are now parts broken down. Next, again, parts broken down, parts broken down, parts broken down. And now we have this line. This one is important to know that mesenteries are actually supplying blood to the large intestine as with the small intestine. This picture is very important. Now you're not going to be asked to label every darn thing on this, even though you should be able to. But you should have a good idea of what we're talking about here. So here's my ileum. Here's my ileocecal valve or sphincter. Here's my cecum, my appendix, ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and then the rectum. Okay. Now the hostra is shown here. And the object of the game is to get this understanding of all these blood vessels here that are part of what? The mesentery. Okay. Next slide. Now, of course, you know that the rectum, the movement of fecal material into rectum, triggers urge to defecate. So there must be a neural connection with the rectum's expanding. So when you get more and more fecal matter in the rectum, then you're going to get the urge to go, and you're going to get the urge to defecate. Okay. So that's what that relates to. Next slide. Anal is really the opening or the exit, the anal orifice. Next, we have our sphincters. Now you may have come across this before. Now this is true not only in the digestive chapter, but also later in the urinary chapter, which will be the next chapter for us, in essence, after chapter 24. Now here's what we got here. The internal sphincter is not voluntary. So the internal sphincter is not voluntary. The external sphincter is voluntary. So this slide is important. So the internal is not voluntary. External is voluntary. Next slide. So that's the portion. Just want to show it to you. And now we have this one. Had I had little blisters here, or swellings, then that would be a sign of a hemorrhoid. So on this picture, if I had hemorrhoids, it would be showing up here. Sometimes you have external hemorrhoids as well. So internal and external. Here is the external sphincter. So you see a little bit, that muscle right there is the external, followed by the internal. So external, internal. Okay, so this picture is important. Next slide. Now remember, the large intestine, they lack villi. That right there should confirm my comment to you. Since large intestine lacks the villi, it's not for absorption of nutrients, but only what? Absorption of water. Next slide. Provides lubrication. It has your lymph nodes that we've talked about. Again, I don't care too much for that slide. Here's what the large intestine will look like. This is what a colon looks like. It does not have the villus. It has these goblet cells for the mucus to help lubricate the food through. Because remember, we are going to dry it out, so we have to somehow move it along. So remember, not really much for absorption other than water. So it's not really for absorption other than water. Next slide. 
It says it again, primarily for what? Absorption of water. Again, what? Vitamins, especially vitamin K. Next slide. Here are the vitamins, again, key vitamins there. Next slide. Now, these are the vitamins I would keep in mind. Vitamin K, we've seen before, biotin, and vitamin B5. So these are your vitamins that are important from the large intestine. That would be test worthy. So vitamin B5, biotin, and vitamin K. Next slide. I talked about stercobilin. Remember I told you stercobilin is what's going to give your poop its color because it's a part of the waste from your bilirubin, your bile. So the bile, the bilirubin, stercobilin, that is what's going to give your color of your poop. These are the other ways that you find in your poop. Hydrogen sulfide, indole, ammonia. Okay. So these are the ones that are responsible for that. So this slide is worthy to keep in mind. Next slide. Gas, flatus, flatuants. Notice bacteria feed on indigestible carbohydrates. So if you actually cut down on your carbohydrates or are able to better absorb your carbohydrates, you will have less gas. If you eat a lot of fiber and a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables, especially the ones that cause gas, then what's going to happen? You're going to slow down your movement because you're going to bulk up your food in your gut, but at the same time, it's going to cause gas because the gas is coming from the bacteria because you have not fully digested the carbohydrates. Okay. So that's how you avoid gas, by watching what you eat and when you eat it. Next slide. Okay. We've already talked about the ileo, or the gastroileal and the gastroenteric reflexes. Notice what it says, move materials into the cecum while you eat. That is why when people are eating, some people have the urge to go because whatever was already in there hours before, that wants to come out now, especially when food goes into the mouth. This one is important to keep in mind. There's often one question related to this. Next slide. This one is very important. So there's always one question related to this. Mass movement. And mass movement is the one that every time to time you get this urge to move forward. Okay. So it says distension of the rectal wall triggers defecation reflex. It says two positive feedback loops. And that is why you move forward as a positive feedback to get the stuff out of you. Okay. Don't care too much about that one. Don't care too much about that one, but I do want you to study this picture. So you have a short reflex, a long reflex. Now, do you see where it says here? S1, S2, L1, L2. Those are the steps that go with the short and the long reflex. So this one is worthy to keep in mind. Now keep in mind, we're also doing what? Controlling the involuntary versus controlling the voluntary. Okay. So this picture is definitely worth keeping in mind. Now notice to move forward, I keep moving forward how? Peristalsis, there it is right there, with what? Parasympathetic. Okay. So parasympathetic. So this picture is worthwhile studying. Okay. Next. This one, don't care for. This one, don't really care for. This one, don't care for. This is a summary sheet letting you know that we have enzymes coming from where. So this is a very good thing in this book, giving you an example of 
what you should have. So there are secretions coming from salivary, from the tongue, from the stomach, from the pancreas. This is what you have to do for me as well. Can you tell me what comes out chemically and what's happening mechanically for each of these places? Next slide. Okay. Now, these are the enzymes that we've spoken of overall. We've mentioned something that is a carbohydrate, protease, lipase overall. Now, what is the name of the game? The name of the game is to break down all of my nutrients into its common form. So proteins need to go all the way down to amino acids. Carbohydrates need to go all the way down to monosaccharide, glucose form, or fructose form. And, and we need to get the lipids down to a triglyceride form. Here's the brush border. These are coming from the small intestinal area. So the small intestinal enzymes. This is a slide definitely worth writing down. So these are your carbohydrates. Notice where they come from. Salivary amylase, as we said, came from there. Pancreatic came from pancreas, so this is pancreatic amylase. Maltase, sucrase, lactase comes from the brush border, small intestines. Uh, this slide I don't really care too, too much for. It's helpful, but I don't care for you to memorize this one. Now, the previous one I put up, that one is important to keep in mind. This one is important to keep in mind. That way you know where they're coming from. So you have a part and where they're coming from. So pancreas, these are your enzymes. Pancreas, your enzymes. We talked about pancreas earlier, trypsin, trypsinogen. So this is very important to keep the structure or the organ and what it produces. Okay, it's very, very important. Again, helpful, but I don't care for that one. I do care for this one. And again, these are all part of the story we've already had. Again, don't care too much for that one. Now let me back up before I go forward anymore. This is the one on lipids. Do you see that linguinal lipase was in the oral cavity? I mentioned it at that time. And then we have our bile salts and we have our little micelles. The bile salts, by way of emulsification, produces little micelles. This is how we get everything absorbed for the fats. The fats, we have triglycerides. These triglycerides are actually assembled in the lining of your gut. So these triglycerides are actually assembled in them. So what goes across? Monoglyceride, fatty acids. And they're assembled as a triglyceride. Then they are coated with a special protein coat called chylomicron. This chylomicron coating is going to go into the lacteal. Now, where in the world will I have this triglyceride returning back to the blood system if it's now in the lymphatic system? We learned that in chapter 22. In chapter 22, you learned that the lymphatic system is connected to the circulatory system at the subclavian vein. And that is what's mentioned right here. Okay. So if you did not get that from that section, this one would be worthwhile to look at. So monosaccharides, fatty acids get absorbed. Triglycerides will then form chylomicrons and then enter into the lacteals. And the chylomicron coating will actually be sort of rubbed off, sh sh shaved off, and then eventually you'll have the triglycerides entering the blood system at the subclavian vein. Okay. okay, I already showed you this earlier, moving forward. Okay, the next slide is this one. Don't care too much for that one. Okay, this one is important. 
I don't care for the numbers. I do care for the pattern. So we have what? 200 mils go in. We're adding what? More saliva to it. We're adding more gastric secretions to it. We're even adding more secretions, more secretions. And we're all doing what? The reabsorbing. The colon will reabsorb a little bit more of the water and the fluids. And then we have only that much lost. Now, why is this a big deal overall, even though I don't care for the numbers? It's because we need to understand that despite how much fluids we put into our body, our body has a unique ability to prevent, prevent water loss through feces. If you looked at a rabbit in the poop of a rabbit, you'll see it's very dry. That's because a rabbit cannot afford to lose a lot of water through the poop, through its feces. Okay, so it can't afford to lose a lot of water. Next slide. Okay. Now, this slide I don't care for, but by now you should have the understanding that water is moving because of what? Osmosis. So when we keep saying in the previous slide, here, all along this, we keep saying water reabsorption, water reabsorption, 780, 1250. Okay, so 7,800, um, 1250. How in the world did we absorb all that water? We did it through osmosis. So all this water reabsorption is done through osmosis, and that's what this slide is getting at. Okay, next, we've also done by ion absorption, such as sodium. Now here the author mentions potassium. If I back up, you'll see sodium. Okay. So we are going to conserve ions, and in doing so, we're going to pull the water with it. Okay, next slide. So, and you know that ion absorption must require some kind of active transport. So it does take ATP to reabsorb water. That's the message they're trying to get across. Okay, vitamins come in two groups, fat soluble, water soluble. Fat soluble, fat soluble ones are A, D, E, K, and water solubles are the B and Cs. Next slide. This slide I don't want you to memorize, but if you look through this, what do you see primarily? Anytime it has to do with very vital ions, it's going to be active transport. Sodium, active transport. Calcium, active transport. Magnesium and iron, active transport. Bicarbonate, not so much other than the pH balance. Phosphate, active transport. So you see, you see a lot of active transport because that's what's going to pull the water. Next slide. Age-related changes. Okay. I do want you to understand that as we age, the cells that line our intestinal lining go bye-bye. That's what the first bullet says. Second bullet, our motility decreases. So what do you see happening to older people? They tend to require medication to do what? Help them with their bowel because they're often constipated, taking things like Exlax and Metamucil and all of that, right? So the object of the game as you get older, is to monitor your peristalsis. Motility will decrease. You'll be more constipated. That's why hemorrhoids and all that are more common older. Then, next slide, last slide, we see colon cancer, stomach cancer on the rise with age. And that makes sense. The decline in olfactory and gustatory sensitivity means that your taste will change. The smell will change. How taste and smell affects your digestive will change. Certain foods will not taste the same anymore. Okay? So all that will be age-related. Okay? Now that ends chapter 24. 
Now before I sign off, it's very important to understand that you make a flow chart. So I would take a structure along the pathway, say mouth or oral cavity, and write down everything that goes with mechanical and everything that goes with chemical, including the names of the chemicals and what they do. When you get to the stomach, same thing. Write down a mechanical story, write down anything that relates to chemicals and what they do. That's going to help you organize chapter 24.